Welcome to worship. Happy Palm Sunday. Again and again, we find that it takes courage to make it through this season of Lent. Again and again, it takes courage to enter the story, to walk with Jesus, to wave the palm branches, to celebrate the cycle of life and death and life again. Welcome to St. Peter's United Church of Christ. My name is Laura Diebenauer, Senior Pastor, and today I'm one who's ready to be courageous. Today I'll enter a conversation with a local rabbi, and today I will offer to you so many ways to engage this season in the way that God loves each of us. You want to know what courage is? Courage is what you're about to hear from three of our youth who boldly use their voices and quite honestly, their smiles to draw us into worship this morning. Again and again, we draw on courage. Let's worship. Loki comes, final take. Vulnerability requires courage. Advocacy requires courage. Facing the unknown requires courage. Honoring our truth requires courage. Listening to another's truth requires courage. And confession, it requires courage as well. So muster up whatever courage you have, and together, let us confess. God of palm branches and hallelujahs, we confess, we love a good Palm Sunday celebration. We love the sound of a joyful parade. We love shouting hallelujah. We love that Palm Sunday means Easter is just around the corner. We love good news. However, if we slow down and pay attention, we know that Palm Sunday was not just a walk in the park for you. There was risk. There was fear. There was threat of violence. You were leading a peaceful protest against an unjust empire. The whole world knew it. Forgive us for glossing over the courage this day took. Remind us that the story of faith is a story of courage. And emulating this, even we can do difficult things. With hope we pray. In your name. Amen. Even when we gloss over the truth, even when we fail, again and again when we feel as if we have no courage, God reminds us that indeed, 
we are not alone. We are loved just as we are. We are needed in this world. And we are a part of the sacred. Be affirmed in that truth. Be courageous in receiving this blessing. In the name of the Creator, the Christ, and the Holy Spirit, again and again, you are loved. If we could buy our way closer to you, we'd sell everything we have. If we could work our way to you, we'd never take a day off. If we could walk our way to you, we'd keep our shoes on tight. But I know, we know, we cannot buy or walk or work our way closer to you. We must listen our way closer to you. So holy God, as you have so often done again and again, open our ears, clear out the self-talk that keeps us from you, dust out the negativity and distractions, remove any doubt hindering our way, help us to hear this scripture. Amen. A reading from John chapter 12 verses 1 through 19. Six days before Passover, Jesus went to Bethany, the village of Lazarus, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. There they gave a banquet in Jesus' honor, at which Martha served. Lazarus was one of those at the table. Mary brought a pound of costly ointment, pure nard, and anointed the feet of Jesus, wiping them with her hair. The house was full of the scent of the ointment. Judas Iscariot, one of the disciples, The one who was to betray Jesus protested. Why wasn't this ointment sold? It could have brought nearly a year's wages and the money been given to the poor people. Judas didn't say this because he was concerned for poor people, but because he was a thief. He was in charge of the common fund and would help himself to it. So Jesus replied, Leave her alone. She did this in preparation for my burial. You have poor people with you always but you won't always have me. Meanwhile, a large crowd heard that Jesus was there and came to see not only Jesus, but also Lazarus, whom he raised from the dead. 
So the chief priests planned to kill Lazarus as well, since it was because of him that many of the people were leaving them and believing in Jesus. The next day, the great crowd that had come for the Passover feast heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. So they got palm branches and went out to meet him. They shouted joyfully, Hosanna, blessed is the one who comes in the name of our God, the ruler of Israel. Jesus rode in, sitting upon a donkey, in accord with the scripture. Fear not, O people of Zion, your ruler comes to you sitting on a donkey's coat. At the time, the disciples didn't understand all this, but after Jesus was glorified, they recalled that the people had done to him precisely what had been written about him. Those who had been present when Jesus called Lazarus from the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to spread the word. A crowd gathered, and they went out to meet Jesus, because they had heard he had performed this miraculous sign. Then the Pharisees said to one another, See, this is getting us nowhere. Look, the whole world is running after him.
Welcome to the Labyrinth at St. Peter's United Church of Christ. Uh, my name is Lori Bevenauer, senior pastor with this congregation, and we are standing in front of a big ampersand. <laughs> and that is because uh, our theme for this season has been again and again. And again and again, I have thought, I should call Justin and we should have a conversation. Uh, again and again, we, we are talking about how the sacred shows up in our lives and how there are so many things that we think we should do and we don't get around to. And this is one of those things that we got around to because <laughs> <laughs> this weekend marks the beginning of Passover. And you want to tell them who you are? <laughs> sure. Hi, I'm Rabbi Justin Kerber from Congregation Beth Shalom in Indianapolis. And I'm delighted to be here. Thanks for having me here to St. Peter's United Church of Christ, Lori. And this weekend also marks Palm Sunday and the beginning of Easter. Yeah, right? do y'all see what we did there? <laughs> He's the Jew, I'm the Christian. <laughs> um, Good but, one. but this is the thing. Uh, Palm Sunday and Passover have a lot to teach us, and I get it wrong all the time. And so I thought Justin and I, who have been working with the Interfaith Alliance here in Carmel, and who have been um, in pandemic with our own congregations, there are so many things that I just don't know. And so I said, hey, Justin, how about you come and you tell me what I'm getting wrong about Passover? <laughs> <laughs> what am I messing up? What do I need to know? What's the big stuff? So, well, thanks. There you go. Thank you so much, Lori. I'm delighted to uh, be here. Thank you so much for asking. And, um, you know, the first thing I want to say is absolutely nothing I'm going to say is about blame or shame. Yep. And nobody should feel badly. That's really not our point. I think it's a great question. I think the really important thing, most important thing, is that we Jews and Christians love to think about how our commonalities, and we yeah. love to think of ourselves as having important similarities. And while that's true, I'm afraid that we sometimes overdo it by thinking about how we have the Bible in common. But yeah. in fact, so much of Judaism today, especially when we're talking about Passover, is post-biblical. It's after the Bible. Um, and that and Judaism and Christianity have a set of shared texts, but we also diverged. The Gospels, uh, which were written in the first century, are in some ways like the divorce papers between Judaism and Christianity. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, so to, I guess to stick with that metaphor, we've, we've learned that even after a divorce, uh, co-parenting can happen. I and, think it's a fabulous yeah, metaphor, it actually. It really is. Right? Like, <laughs> yeah. like, the Gospels were written at a time when Jews and Christians, it, there wasn't a whole lot of seeing of eye to eye. There, there were problematic realities. Right. And so a divorce was happening for probably good reason, Mm -hmm. which does in fact happen. And now, all these years later, we are realizing that we are stronger when we can work together and when we notice things that, that one another are doing that might be problematic or that might be helpful, it just works better if we talk about it, <laughs> right. right? So like this yeah. idea of co-parenting the world into justice or into experiences of peace or mm -hmm. us standing together when mm -hmm. the tragedies happen, Mm -hmm. It's not lost on us that we would do better if we simply just talk about these things and stay grounded in our traditions, right. but definitely move in that direction. Right. So let's talk about it. Um, what's happening in the first century is, a, uh, is Roman occupation of what was then called Palestine. Uh, a leader emerges in the Jewish public, this figure who is today thought known as Jesus, probably yep. Yehoshua. Um, he is put to death by Rome. Mm -hmm. um, that is a terrible, terrible disappointment for his Jewish followers who begin spreading this idea that he didn't really die. He has either come back for the de from the dead or is coming back from the dead. Right. Well, that idea among, it sounds funny to say, <laughs> among the Palestinian Jewish Christians. <laughs> yes, I really mean all three of that. Yes. <laughs> uh, that idea really goes nowhere. Yeah. Uh, that idea 
doesn't catch on among the Jews of Roman Palestine. Um, it's simply not what they're expecting. But Chris, like a runner false starting, the, this idea of Christianity picks itself up, brushes itself off, and starts all over again. And that idea goes everywhere among Gentiles in the diaspora outside of Palestine. It's they who write these Gospels, uh, these narratives. Uh, they're writing much later than the, uh, than the scenes they depict. They're writing in Greek, not yes. in Hebrew. They aren't familiar with the customs, and they are, and there's at least one other time, place, language, and culture. It's not their culture either. Right. Uh, and so, well, um, the, the anti-Judaism that manifests in these writings because they are creating a separate Gentile Christianity morphs this figure, Jesus, from a Jew killed by Rome into a Christian killed by Jews. Yep. That idea has tragic life and death consequences. Still to this day. Yes, unfortunately. Now, I should also say that anti-Judaism in the Gospels is very different from modern anti-Semitism, which is as much racial as it is religious. Right. That's right, I just said anti-Semitism is a kind of racism. This is exactly why we're talking. <laughs> it cannot be lost on any of us that we are talking just days after another mass murder. Mm -hmm. um, certainly in a season in which racism matters, it always has and always should, but it has become heightened for a lot of us in religious communities for very good reason, in my mm -hmm. opinion. Mm -hmm. And I think these roots are really important, mm -hmm. right? That what's mm -hmm. been translated and what's been called culture or religious tradition is actually been co-opted and corrupted in a lot of ways. And just the beginnings of these conversations, I think really help us out. We've been wrestling with it too. I'm so, thank you very much for saying that out loud. It needs to be said out loud. We've been wrestling too in the American Jewish community today. It's even more complicated now than it ever was. Uh, we are a lot more diverse than we were when I was growing up. Today, it's not unusual for there to be, for example, Asian American women who are Jewish yep. in our congregations, or African Americans who are Jewish. Um, the Passover Seder takes on a whole different residence when you have black Jews around the Seder table. A hundred percent. Yeah. And so, yeah. Well, and, and I'm going to jump us to where I think we were going, which mm -hmm. is Christianity gets, oh, we're going to get branches too. Wow. <laughs> that was impressive. <laughs> Maybe. I don't know what it was. All right. Despite the branches and the trees falling around <laughs> us in the wind. Uh, you know, I asked, I asked Rabbi Justin what we get mixed up about Passover and, and the same could be asked of Christianity and Easter. Um, so Palm Sunday is leading up to Easter. This is our whole Holy Week. Um, and Easter really gets messed up in a lot of Christianity, I'm going to say. <laughs> we, we have pretty much focused on this bodily resurrection. Did Christ come alive again? Was he ever in a tomb? What happened? And jelly beans and Easter bunnies. <laughs> and like, there are some roots that we could go into, um, but let me just suffice it to say that when we get distracted by Easter being only about whether Christ physically rose again, I believe we miss the entire point of Easter, which is that there is always new life around us. Regardless of how it happened, if it happened, whether it should have happened, I, I actually don't care. <laughs> <laughs> I like that the story gets me to a point of saying there is new life. I actually feel that new life between us. Like there is new life happening because of this con conversation. Mm -hmm. I like to think that there is new life happening as we delve into these deeper yeah. communications. So that for me, that's Easter. It's a conversation about new life. And if you want to get into all those details about what really happened, it, it's going to be sorely disappointing. Because mm -hmm. the bottom line is we don't know. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of mythology and a lot of question. I, I think that's really good. And our congregation likes to stand in that place. Mm -hmm. um, I do want to throw in, we have, we have two visuals we want to yes. show. Yes, yes. So these things that are be, uh, down here, mm -hmm. my favorite palm branches. <laughs> All right, just ruin it for me. <laughs> okay, so, well, the good news is that there really would likely have been palm branches brought by pilgrims to Jerusalem. Um, 
Well, you can see, I have a picture of myself, uh, thankfully not wearing the exact shirt I'm wearing right now, but close <laughs> enough, uh, of myself holding a lulav, uh, which is um, a bundle of four different species of, of tree branches uh, used at the Jewish holiday of Sukkot. The thing is that Sukkot takes place in the fall, uh, always after the Jewish Day of Atonement on Yom Kippur. Mm -hmm. uh, so. Uh, a lulav it contains not only a palm branch, uh, although it's the spine of the palm tree, it's right. not this frond here, yes. as well as leaves of myrtle and um, willow, willow uh, as well as a large fruit that looks like a lemon. It's called an etrog in Hebrew. I think the English word for it is a citron. Cool. Um, that is to fulfill the sacred obligation, the mitzvah, uh, that you'll find in Leviticus chapter 23, verse 40. But for us, the Bible, the Torah is never just a, a it never ends a conversation. It always begins one. How do you use these things? What do they represent? Um, the, um, the lulav is taken um, in, the, in the hands on Sukkot. Um, you will find Jews keep them around, Jewish families keep them around throughout the year sometimes. It gets all nice and dry and desiccated. By this time of year, you then use it to burn your chametz. It makes very good fire starter. That's right. And so as we say, one mitzvah, go reret mitzvah, one sacred obligation, draws another one along. So, and the connection in Christianity is these palm branches that we often wave, um, sometimes in parade, but more often and more accurately in protest. Mm. Um, we talk about them lining the road. What happens with them for us is once they get all dried up, mm. we burn them mm -hmm. and they are used as ashes at the ah. beginning of the Lenten season. So that would have been uh. six weeks ago on Ash Wednesday. Uh -huh. We use the burnt palms to make the sign of the cross on the forehead I'm not sure I ever saw that, ever knew about that. Oh, here that. you go. Okay. It gets good, right? Oh, right? We use the phrase and the scripture, remember that you are dust, mm -hmm. and to dust you shall return. Mm -hmm. So the entire experience of Jesus um, going through his experience from life to death, potentially the resurrection, then becomes back to us in this idea of our lives being temporary as well. Hmm. I might mention when you were talking about new life and yeah. green things growing, I'm very much reminded of karpas on the Seder plate. A green vegetable always oh. winds up on a Seder plate for exactly that, re that same symbolism, the yeah. rebirth and renewal of spring. I love it. Yeah, yeah. Well, there's so, so many connections we could uh, talk uh, forever. Uh, we're going right. to show you one more picture mm -hmm. and then, then we're good. So mm -hmm. I'm going to make this clearer for you. So why don't you mm. and I just look here. Sure. Um, so this particular image is of Jesus riding into Jerusalem. You'll see the palm branches. Um, what I love about it and what the reason I wanted to bring it up is it feels like too often we face these holidays from behind. We just look at them from afar. Like this is what I'm supposed to do for Passover, for Easter, for Sunday. We do the same with justice issues, right? I'm gonna just be on the outside of that conversation, right? I'm just gonna look at it from afar where it's safer this picture for me reminds me that what Jesus is seeing is different than what I might see. And I need to hear his story. I need to hear your story about Passover because mm -hmm. I'm not at the Passover Seder. Mm -hmm. And you might need to hear my story about Easter. Mm -hmm. Rather than just assuming we know what's going on, when we're able to get behind a story and then really walk with a person, I think everything changes. You know, I, um, it's a beautiful painting. I love watercolors. Um, I like doing watercolors myself. I am reminded of an experience I had doing clinical pastoral education, that's hospital ministry, ch yeah. chaplaincy training, um, how uh, in 2014 and 2015, long story short, uh, had a very difficult and uncomfortable and unpleasant experience the first time around. But once I figured out how to do that, how to have that conversation, um, I realized that the story in, I think it was, well, not all of the Gospels are the same. Right. And the, I think it was maybe the one in Luke Acts is very different than the one in John, which is the one I had heard the previous sure, year. Sure, yeah. Making it much more of a, of a, 
he just brought up some more of the stuff that we've been talking about. Yeah. It was a lot easier for me to hear. And, yeah. and that was a hard conversation with a lot of tears on both sides, but it was worth it. I was grateful we had stuck around with it. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah so. the gospels for the record don't all tell the same story of Palm Sunday mm -mm. and the palms aren't in every story. Aha. Uh -huh. Just just in case one wanted to know. <laughs> so that's our encouragement. Yeah. Um, yeah. We are hopeful. Hey. This mm -hmm. isn't always comfortable, right? No. Like we have not known no. each other for decades. It's mm -mm. actually been just a couple years, really. Yeah. Um, and starting the conversation matters. And mm -hmm. so we would encourage that of you as this holy time begins in both traditions, get a little deeper. You know what? Make the phone call. You know what? Um, let me say this too. Um, I'd really, really rather Christians not try to do Passover seders, but you're welcome to come to ours. Send me an email, and I'll send you a link to our community seder on March on Sunday, March 28th. This is really good wisdom. <laughs> <laughs> really good wisdom. We don't need to recreate because our friends are doing it and inviting us. That makes way more sense. I love it. I love it too. Great. Hey, friends, we'll see you again. Enjoy the journey. Happy Passover. What do we say? Yeah, that's perfect. Happy Passover. Okay, good. And happy happy Easter Sunday to you. And, happy Easter. <laughs> and so it goes. Thanks so much. Perhaps holding on to our own palms or imagining the palms waving on a beach somewhere. Or maybe just remembering those photographs of palms around the world. We lean into this time of prayer, knowing that there are symbols that carry us to other places, other times, other memories, symbols and reminders of both joy and challenge, drawing into the many truths of this Palm Sunday, we allow our prayers to be wonderings, letting go of all that holds us back, holding on to all that grounds us in God's love. We pray. I wonder if Jesus could feel his heart beat in his throat the way I do when I'm afraid. I wonder if he had to take deep breaths in through his nose, 
out through his mouth, tricking his body into a state of calm. I wonder if he was nauseous, like I am, when I'm headed into a difficult conversation. I wonder if he had to summon his courage, tucking fear away so that he could hold onto what mattered most with both hands. I wonder, because time has taught us that it is not uncommon for a peaceful protest to start or end with an unjust death. So I wonder, did he know? Was he afraid? Did anyone see it? I want to hold what matters, what matters most, with both hands. God, we wonder What is it that we know? What is it that we fear? And does anybody see us? Remind us in these moments of prayer that fear can be healthy, that knowledge is often power, And that being seen is a gift, a gift that we can give to others. God, show us how to sit up tall, how to stand up for justice, how to dwell in possibility as we unite our voices together with all the visions all the inconsistencies, all the conversations that this Palm Sunday and Passover hold for us. Stretching just a little bit, we pray. Our Creator God, holy be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, now and forever. Amen. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy, Lord, have mercy, have mercy, O Lord. Good morning, St. Peter's. I'm Bob Warner, and it is my pleasure and privilege to have this opportunity to speak with you about why St. Peter's United Church of Christ is so important to me and my family. I'm going to share with you a little bit about what prompted us to visit for the first time, about why we decided to come back on a regular basis, about why we chose to become members, and also why we decided to financially contribute to the welfare, the care, and the mission of St. Peter's. United Church of Christ. About six or seven years ago, Monica, my wife, and I were looking for a new church home for our family. Of We've got three kids, Madeline, Patrick, and Claire. We were looking for an open-minded, loving, caring, uh, affirming church that had a strong sense of mission, was Christ-focused, was a good neighbor and good contributor in their community. Upon the recommendation of a friend of ours who used to work at the St. Peter's preschool, we decided to visit. We visited St. Peter's. We almost immediately liked what we saw, what we heard, what we felt when we were there. And it prompted us to decide that we were going to come back. About a week, well it was a week after our first visit, we had a nice person stop by right as we were pulling out of the driveway for spring break. Judy Jutras stopped by our house. We didn't know Judy at that time. And she identified herself as Judy from St. Peter's and brought this very thoughtful gift. 
and we took that as a sign. We loved the cookies. It was a great way to kick off our spring break, and we thought that was, we took that as a sign that maybe this was the right place, and we continued to come back to St. Peter's over the course of the following weeks, and we became, uh, we came for about two years before we became members, and during those two years, we were able to participate in several of the mission opportunities and when I say us, I also mean our kids. And that was really important to us, that our kids had an opportunity to do some of the things that the church had been involved in. We participated in Family Promise. We participated in the Rural Health Assisted Living Facility with the mission work there. Patrick got involved in the youth group at ninth grade. He was not very, uh, he was a little bit awkward. He was not very outgoing, he's pretty shy, not so sure of himself, and we really believe that through his four years of participation in the youth group in which he got to go to Washington United Church of Christ in Cincinnati and participate in the mission there for four summers, working with underprivileged kids, really gave him a great sense of working with people that were less fortunate than him, but it also put him in a position of leadership, in a position where he could work and participate and be an important member of a team like that. He also participated in Family Promise, as did both Madeline and Claire. They've been given the opportunity to work with the kids there and see how people that are less fortunate, how we can help them and see how sometimes it's not really that fair why they aren't better off than they really are. We really feel that it's given our kids an opportunity to learn and to grow and to become better human beings. Uh, so that's one of the th most important things that we've gotten from St. Peter's. Monica and I also feel very strongly about our opportunity to be a service through, uh, through Family Promise, through Rural Health. I get an opportunity to participate in the music ministry, which I really enjoy. These are all very important elements in our decision to become members, to stay members, and also to continue to financially support St. Peter's United Church of Christ. And I'm really pleased to have the opportunity to ask you to consider it as well and to see what is in your heart and how you can contribute financially to the ongoing ministry and work of St. Peter's United Church of Christ. Thank you very much for your time. Just one more thing. I forgot to mention what St. Peter's has meant to me and my family during this time of pandemic. We have really felt, in a way, even closer to St. Peter's during this time because of all the different ways and means and opportunities that St. Peter's has provided for each of us to stay connected. And I know it's been challenging and each of us has felt a little bit differently about our individual experiences, but for me being able to stay in touch and contact, to be together while apart through our Sunday services on YouTube, through the follow-up church chat, which has meant a great deal to me, uh, our fellowship walks, our game nights, our virtual get-togethers through the Spiritual Life team. These have been all very, very important to me and my family for us to stay connected. And it's one of the things that I really love about St. Peter's. So thank you again for your time. And please consider how you can financially support St. Peter's United Church of Christ. Thanks again. Greg and I refuse to believe that we are powerless. We refuse to believe that injustice and hatred are simply the way it has to be. I refuse to believe that I am better or more deserving than my neighbor. We refuse to believe that our self-worth is rooted in our accomplishments or appearance. 
Greg and I refuse to believe that the church is dying because we see God all around us. We refuse to believe that the traditions of old are the only path for moving forward. We refuse to believe that we cannot make a difference. So with hope in our hearts, we will strive to live a life of courage, conviction, and compassion, just as Jesus taught us. Amen. Again and again, God meets us. Again and again, we are called to listen. Again and again, we are shown the way. Again and again, God loves first. Again and again, we are reformed. Again and again, we draw on courage. As you leave this time and space, may your mouth speak of God's goodness. May your arms hold those in need. May your feet walk towards justice. May your heart trust in its worth. May your soul dance in God's grace. And may this be your rhythm again and again and again until God's promised day. In the name of the lover, the beloved, and love itself, go with courage Go with heart, go in peace. Amen. Amen.